All right, my friends, as I told you in class, uh, the discussion that we are reviewing, the slides that we're looking at today, uh, I warned you in advance that I was a bit biased. Um, so as a, as a follower of Christ, there's certain things in my worldview um, are prickled by the Enlightenment and its um, beliefs. So let's talk about them. And uh, I will um, answer uh, with my objections, and then I will leave it to you in your own research <laughs> to, to disagree or to agree and to build on maybe what we talk about. So I'm going to introduce you to some characters today, mainly uh, Rousseau, and then Edmund Burke, and his adversary, um, uh, Reverend Price. So that's where we'll we'll kind of end up our discussion because I think, uh, and I'm hoping to prove my case here, at least point you uh, in the direction of seeing that some of the Enlightenment values would naturally lead to a uh, no holds barred national revolution like we have in France. So we'll talk about that. Um, the Enlightenment values, some of the things that we could could mention um, in this uh, this short-lived uh, intellectual movement, um, they question traditional authority and embrace the notion that humanity could be improved through rational change. So they began to see growth and movement in science, growth and movement in uh, ideas of politics and understanding maybe in a new way uh, the nature of man and uh, they became what I think is a bit naive about what could be accomplished with man on his own. Uh, they had a belief in our sort of inevitable progress through dialogue as we talk together, as we learn, as we grow, as we mature, um, then the um, mankind uh, progresses. And then they said that everything in the universe could be rationally demystified and cataloged. So there was a man, Diderot, who put to, wanted to assemble an encyclopedia that would uh, describe all of human knowledge as we knew it. And he enlisted some of the, some of the great uh, thinkers of that day to write for his encyclopedia, uh, notwithstanding, as we'll see a quote in a minute, uh, Rousseau himself. Uh, so this is the Enlightenment. It seems to me it's sort of a naive or a pride-filled attempt to see what we can do independently to lift man up by his own bootstraps and to cut off ourselves from the past uh, in which we saw ourselves and our fortunes inevitably tied to the Christian God. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that um, here are some more Enlightenment principles. Change and reform are possible and desirable. Uh, they had great confidence in the human mind and wisdom and scientific advance. I have to say that uh, science was already getting its feet under itself and beginning to move. And some of the earliest Christians, if you look at uh, uh, Nancy's Nancy Piercy's book on the soul of science, you'll see that science was getting up and running pretty good by the time uh, the Enlightenment came around. The Enlightenment sort of jumped onto the back of the, the wagon as it went through. Uh, but we can't necessarily say that scientific advance came because of the Enlightenment or because of its principles. Again, my bias, you may have to check that out for yourself. And then they had a confidence in the power of rational criticism to impact every corner of contemporary society, politics, and religious opinion. And uh, again, they, that is the exact description of a worldview. Um, question is, what was the content of what that worldview was? Because even Christians will want to say that they want to impact with salt and light every corner of contemporary society. So there you are. Um, and then finally, they challenged the authority of tradition. Uh, you could almost read there the church. 
and the Christian past. And uh, here again, I know the church has made a lot of mistakes over the centuries, um, but they have done an incredible amount of good, and that should not be overlooked. And certainly, whatever the church has failed, uh, there has been a benevolent and sovereign and omnipotent deity standing behind all of it, um, desiring to move uh, in and around society, and especially in the hearts of its patrons. So. Those are the Enlightenment principles, and let's talk about uh, the three stages. First stage, uh, the early Enlightenment, it got started in the 17th century, late in the 17th century, and then into the, into the 18th century. If you look at these dates, the Puritan century that we talked about before is coming to an end in England, and now this is rising in France and some of the other um, European countries. And it takes a different flavor in Italy than it does in um, the uh, in France or in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, but uh, let's talk about at least a couple of examples from that time. Uh, we have Isaac Newton uh, and his his important work in mathematics. Uh, but he was a genius in all kinds of things in optics and physics even did uh, some work in theology, and uh, but got started because he was interested in turning lead into gold. So that was Isaac Newton. And then we have John Locke um, in his essay concerning human understanding, again looking for ways in which human beings can um, begin to understand the world around them. In his mind, to do it by experience rather than outside truth. And if you are looking at the time, outside truth is another word for general and specific revelation, which we've talked about in other places, which tell us from the outside things we could not know on our own. The stars declare the glory of God and God's word tells us what he is like. So this is sort of a reaction to that. Let's see what we can learn on our own apart from Revelation. And then Locke believed that human nature was changeable, which means it didn't have an objective foundation. In Christianity, the objective foundation for the nature of man is found in the image of God. Uh, and so man is a being made in the image of God, designed to reflect his attributes to the rest of creation. So that's a little bit different than what Locke is describing here. So we move from the early enlightenment into the high enlightenment. This is the time that Diderot's encyclopedia comes together. There's also the time of Rousseau's social contract. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that social contract. What we'll say about uh, the encyclopedia was and it was an ambitious attempt to put together in one place all that mankind has yet learned. And you can see the incredible size that volume would take place today as uh, the, the understanding and wisdom and knowledge that we have of the world around us is so much bigger than anything that we would have thought um, in Diderot's time. It's also interesting, probably we know what we don't know a lot better. So there we are. So we have the early enlightenment, we have the high enlightenment, and then the later enlightenment. Um, the focal point for this time is the French Revolution. So we want to talk a little bit about that because it seems to me some of the ideas that come up in the enlightenment were not enlightening. Uh, they were instead darker elements that ended up causing what could have been predicted, in fact was predicted by Edmund Burke, to cause the society to devolve into a bloody terror and that the society would eventually trade freedom for security and that would give rise to a dictator. And Edmund Burke was exactly right about the rise of Napoleon. So there we are. Uh, let's talk about Rousseau then. Here is his social contract. Uh, there is his smiling face. 
and his quote, I am not like anyone I have been acquainted with, perhaps like no one in existence. If not better, I at least claim originality, and whether nature has acted rightly or wrongly in destroying the mold in which she cast me can only be decided after I have been read. <laughs> so they're uh, a self-confident uh, beginning uh, to his work on the social contract. Um, he says he was a Roman before he turned 12, which means he had a real appreciation for Greek and Roman culture early on. Um, he had a patron who helped to fund his life in writing and thinking, and that was Madame de Warrens. Uh, she um, was just his patron who helped to, to pay the bills. Uh, as he wrote, as he thought, as he traveled. He also had a uh, well, he had Teresa Lesseur <laughs> and uh, he had several children by her and they were all abandoned to a foundling hospital uh, to be cared for uh, so he didn't follow through on any sort of uh, family concerns. When he was asked to write, he had already made a pledge to help Diderot with the encyclopedia, but he said uh, he was worn out. Um, so I wanted to read this quote because it gives you a sense of how he wrote what he wrote for the encyclopedia. I am worn out, but I have given my promise and one must keep one's word. Besides, I want to get at the throats of people who have treated me badly, and bio gives me strength, even intelligence and knowledge. Uh, so there we are. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the way in which Rousseau wrote about the need for an understanding of politics that begins with what he calls a social contract. Uh, so there are four elements, and we'll show those in a minute first element is the state of nature. It is a presupposition by social contract thinkers that says this is what man was like before the advent of the social contract. So it's, it's an assumption of what man started out like. So somebody uh, dark like Thomas Hobbes will say we are, um, we are nasty and slavish and brutish. Um, Rousseau will have a pretty rosy picture of who we are individually. Um, but the idea of the state of nature is that condition before the government's foundation. All right, so here are the elements of that social contract. For Rousseau, we are not brutish, we are not uh, short, as Thomas Hobbes says. For him, our beginning nature was one of simple goodness. Um, we were peaceful and quaint and uh, so our pre-civilized situation, uh, we only had a few natural needs for which we would need to come together in a social contract. And that agreement was the way we put that contract together. The reason we needed a government was for equality and for freedom. Um, so uh, the social contract thinkers said that the social contracts exist to protect property and inequality. But Rousseau said um, it ought to help to resurrect the way things had before, had been before. So um, the social contract is a desire to um, bring back that peaceful and, and quaint time of the past. And so you want a kind of government that will help you accomplish that. And if you can do it, then the fourth part of a social contract is the idea of revolt. And if you can do it, then uh, there is no need for revolt. Uh, so that is what, uh, what Rousseau wrote in his social contract. So here's what he, what he surmised. Here's how that social contract would work. He said this, how can we live together without succumbing to the force and coercion of others? We can do so by submitting our individual particular wills to the collective or general will created through agreement with other free and equal persons. So here's how that original government formed. You and I had our own individual particular wills. 
And we got together and said we need to have a government. And so voluntarily, each of us individually, we gave over, we submitted, we handed over our individual particular rights and will to a collective or general will. So the general will is the sum total of all particular wills. And then that collective will, the general will, would begin to form in a government that was in the best interest of the people that it set out to serve. After that, the people who had the individual and particular wills um, must always submit those things to the general will. So that Rousseau will even say at some point, if your government asks you to die for it, then you should die for it because previously you have received all the benefits. So you have, you have given up your own rights, even your right to life, in order to submit to that general will um, because that is going to look out for all of us together. And uh, so it's an interesting thought, but it seems to me it could easily lead to a kind of tyranny. Uh, we're going to cut across the English Channel then for a little bit and uh, talk about Edmund Burke. Because what I see in Rousseau and what I see in some of the um, thinking in the Enlightenment would be the kind of self-confidence, the kind of rationality that would say, we can plan our own destiny. We have the ability, the rational um, understanding to be able to design our own world and write on this tabula rasa, this blank slate, whatever it is that we wish to do. And that's the kind of thinking that led to the French Revolution, and then one revolution after another, as this government is formed and then overtaken by another government, by another government, and Edmund Burke then surprises, surmises that people will eventually get so tired of the revolution and the continuing war that they will trade their freedom for security. And when somebody comes along who is willing to help them accomplish that, uh, then that will be the rise of a tyrant. Enter Napoleon. All right. So Edmund Burke is considered the father of conservatism. And he is the one who, as he watched the things beginning to unfold in France, uh, said this is an incredible thing. All circumstances taken together, the French Revolution is the most astonishing thing that has happened hitherto in the world. It is a spirit of innovation, and it is a selfish temper and confined views. And he says, people who will not look forward to posterity, or people will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. So, one uh, biographer said Burke was endowed with the ability to detect in the seemingly tangled fabric of present things the thread of the future, and he predicted with almost mathematical reasoning the rise of a dictator, and after his fall, the restoration of the old monarchy. <laughs> so there you are. This is, this is Edmund Burke. Uh, as the father of conservative, he had problems with uh, three different issues, and let me explain them real quick because it helps to understand, again, the Enlightenment. The first one is the idea of anti-abstractionism. Uh, this is the rallying flag of empty words. So you see it in the Tale of Two Cities. Uh, Dickens puts them in there. Um, they use a word like equality or a word like fraternity, but they are you know, if we if we held a vote and I ask you, are you for fraternity? Everybody in the room would probably raise their hands. But if I then defined fraternity and put some content into that empty vessel word, then we would begin to have disagreements and debates as to what really ought to happen. So abstractionism is a way of rallying people around your flag, your word, and everybody thinking they're united, 
but really the the word is empty and we won't know what it means until the person in power eventually fills that empty word with its meaning so burke says you've got to watch out for words that are abstracts and rallying points uh, you have to know what it is that you are going to fight for and then his second point is that we have to be loyal to the nature of things um, things are what they are and so loyalty to the nature of things means um, we recognize who we are we are made in the image of god we are also fallen creatures and so we have to respect both elements which is why our founding fathers in the united states put together uh, checks and balances because they wanted to respect the freedoms of men but they wanted to make sure they could check that downward pull um, in order that it didn't lead to chaos as everybody did whatever they wanted so we have to understand the nature of things and be loyal to what it is and then the last one is if things are not going as you wish uh, you will be patient you will show patience uh, you will wait you will push you will you will try to win your argument uh, win people for your side but you will be patient because impatience leads to a lot of hasty well, in the case of the French Revolution, a lot of hasty violence. All right, I mentioned Edmund Burke then. He's noted for his oratory. He was um, raised, uh, his father was Protestant, his mother was Catholic, so he sits uh, with one foot, uh, both feet, uh, firmly planted in the Christian worldview. Um, he wrote uh, a speech, uh, delivered a speech before Parliament, uh, on conciliation uh, with the 13 colonies. Uh, his goal was to have us separated, but uh, working together as friends rather than the way parliament was heading and making the new world the enemy of the uh, British Empire. So that was uh, Burke's argument there. His nemesis in arguing for other things was uh, Randall Price, and uh, Price was a, a pamphleteer. He's like uh, Thomas Paine. He writes uh, caustically. He writes well. He writes convincingly. Um, and so you read and you get fired up. Uh, so he's a moral and political philosopher. Um, he influenced Thomas Paine. Uh, he influenced uh, Mary Shelley's mom uh mary wollstonecraft and uh then he had a little theological issues there with uh, original sin and moral punishment so these two people hold a debate and it is sometimes referred to as the last political discourse uh, so you can read for yourself those two um burke's speech on conciliation with america and price has a discourse on the love of our country and in both of them they both agree that the american war for independence uh, should be supported uh, they will disagree vehemently about the french revolution burke said the french revolution was the violent overthrow of legitimate government a lot of burke's book reflections on the revolution in, Pr in france has to do with defending the the rights of kings and the aristocracy and, and ideas of paternalism and loyalty and the hereditary principle and property. So Burke is very conservative in his political views for that time. And Randall Price is uh, in, um, he hates corruption. That would be what you would expect perhaps from a pamphleteer um, because again, I'm all for hating corruption as well. Um, so what do you mean by that? How is that supposed to play out? Um, he was all for a sense of personal liberty and autonomy, and he hated wars that were simply fought over uh, land between one uh, nation or ethnic group and another. So as I said, 
people who have looked back on the debate between these two people have said that it was the last real discussion of the fundamentals of politics. One of Randall Price's sermons, this is Randall Price, um, you can catch his, his energetic or caustic spirit in this quote, tremble all ye oppressors of the world, take warning all ye supporters of slavish governments and slavish hierarchies, call no more absurdly and wickedly reformation or innovation. You cannot now hold the world in darkness, struggle no longer against increasing light and liberality, restore to mankind their rights and consent to the correction of abuses before they and you are destroyed together. How's that? All right. Uh, so you get the feeling for the differences between an Edmund Burke and the passion of a Randall Price. Uh, Burke is wanting to put the brakes on things and think them through. Uh, Randall Price is, uh, if I may, uh, willing to throw a little gas on the fire uh, to get things really moving. That said, then I want to show you a political cartoon uh, from the time that sort of shows how uh, this debate eventually turned out. Uh, so if you were sitting in my class, you would look at this and we would try to interpret it together, but it looks like I'm going to have to do all the interpretation <laughs> in our time together. So you can see that Edmund Burke has a really long nose. He can smell out a rat. Uh, he can... Uh, show the, the problems in the midnight machinations of a uh, Randall. Yeah, Randall Price. Sorry about that. Um, you can see that Edmund Burke is going to defend the crown, the hierarchy, and he's going to defend, on the other hand, uh, Christendom as well. But you notice the colors of the crown and the colors of the chair in which Randall Price sits are the same. So the crown has passed from legitimate authority in the minds of Edmund Burke uh, to each individual. And so Randall Price gets to sit on his own seat, which looks surprisingly like a throne. Right? So you got uh, Edmund Burke scooting in in the middle of the night. Uh, you've got Randall Price startled. Uh, as he writes in the dark of night, um, away from the the crowds, so he can, well, what's he, what do you do at midnight that is ever any good? <laughs> so there's that kind of thing. And then you can see, of course, he decorates his house with the death of Charles and the glory of Great Britain. And you can see, um, well, the precursor to an eventual guillotine. So there's a little bit of uh, what's happening during that 18th century um, as the, the Puritan century gives rise to the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment gives rise, unfortunately, uh, to the French Revolution. Uh, you've heard some of the principal players uh, that were involved in either promoting the French Revolution or trying to stop its... Um, ideas philosophically from spreading. And so we have uh, somewhat to be thankful for, uh, for Edmund Burke. So there we are. Thanks for hanging out with me. And uh, we look forward to talking again soon.